are going to start with the Mongols. Now the Mongols are going to be nomadic in route. Now all of the nodes are on the board because we need to get through this as quick as possible. If you have it on your phone, you're more than welcome to look at your phone to make it easier to read. I do not care. Now the Mongols are going to be based in Central Asia. In Central Asia, we call it the steep region. There is not much rainfall. If there's not a lot of rainfall, there's not a lot of irrigation. Without irrigation, there is no agriculture. The biggest issue with Central Asia is that there's just not that much good agrable land, which means people have to depend on a pastoral life or herding animals. So Central Asia, very little rainfall, which means no large scale animal uh, agriculture, which means they depend on animal herding. They really do depend on goats and sheep the most. That's really what they're known for. Today in Central Asia, in Mongolia today, there's still a ton of nomadic farmers that are wandering around and still uh, continuing the tradition of it. Um, they're migratory, which means they move by season. When it's spring, they head north. When it's fall, they head south and they lead their flocks. They depend on goats and sheep for everything, food, Clothing, shelter. They use the animal skin in order to make uh, huts, which they can easily transport when the seasons change. Um, while trade is going to start with um, Silk Road, it's actually the Mongols who are going to be the, uh, the original carriers of trade. They are, of course, going to rise with the Mongolian Empire during period late three, early four. But they are the foundation of the very beginning. Um, so what we're going to see is the Mongols are going to be the backbone of the Silk Road. So it's not just like when the empire arises, which is going to happen now. They have been a part of it since period two. However, the Mongolian Empire, when you think the Mongols, aren't showing up until the end of three. So one of the coolest things about the Mongols is that their government structure is very, very lax. It is all clan base, which means it's all family ties. Now the thing that makes them different than what's happening in Scotland, Ireland, England, which is also using clans, starting to develop into kings, is that in Mongolia, so say Max is our noble, and he has a crappy son named Jack, who's like an idiot ruler, okay? So Max was a great ruler, Jack is a terrible ruler, we can just kill Jack and appoint Lauren, who is a great leader. So when we talk about clan base, we're talking about um, appointing the most effective leaders in power. That is very unique to the Mongols. This has been a tradition. So when we have the Mongolian Empire, they're going to use merit as a base of government structure. And that's the biggest thing. So unlike Europe, so if Max is our leader and we have a kid named Jack who shows up, who's a terrible leader, we're stuck with Jack, which means his son or daughter is going to be a terrible leader too because Jack's a terrible leader. We're stuck with them for generations. Mongols say, well, if Jack's a terrible leader, let's just kill him and appoint someone effective. And that is really cool about the Mongols. Okay, now... When we talk about the Mongols, we need to make sure that we are discussing um, the merit-based society. Now, the cool thing about the Mongols is that they are really good to Mongolian women. If you are a Mongol woman, you're doing incredibly well. This is a great time to be alive. They have some Mongol Mongolian women rulers. They have some... Um, a lot of women are uh, advisors to the military. They are seen as equal partners with their husband. It's really the first time that we see women on an equal playing field anywhere um, once farming starts, which is pretty cool. This is a good thing if you're a Mongolian woman. If you are not a Mongolian woman, they treat you like trash and they will rape you and burn you because they can. Max, right in Things. So, women, gender relations, um, for Mongolian women, please make sure you understand that, not for all women. Now, the religion of the Mongols is going to be shamanism. Now, shamanism is the belief that the earth has power 
has control, has influence. And a shaman reigns in that power and can use it. Okay? Eventually, we're going to see that Buddhism, Christianity, and Islam are going to start making their way in. Why is Buddhism, Islam, and Christianity going to start making their way in, Is the Because they were like migrating to other areas. Okay, and what's going through? The Silk Road. The Silk Road is going to carry these religions into the Mongols. Remember, these religions are going to spread along the Silk Road. So if the Mongols are the foundation of the Silk Road, it makes sense that that would actually start triggering a reaction. Now, when we have religion, um, we're going to have a little bit of writing. The Mongolians are not known for their academics, because frankly, they didn't really have that many academics. Okay? They embraced other cultures' academics once they took over. They don't have academia for themselves, because they really don't write. They're nomads. They're constantly hurting rather than writing and doing science. Okay? However, it is important to note that there will be a large conversion to Islam in the 10th century due to the Silk Road and Abbasid influence. Okay, once you get here to a large conversion of Islam in the 10th century, stop. Put your pens down so I can see where you are. Once you get to a large conversion to Islam in the 10th century, please stop so I can see exactly where we are. Don't get ahead of me. It's better if you're doing it while I'm doing it. You have all the notes already? So Alright, to the boards, let's go. On your whiteboard, please tell me where do the Mongolians um, come from? Where do Mongolians come from? No. Where? Where? Read. Central Asia, on your whiteboard, please tell me um, what is um, the foundation of their government structure? What is their foundation for their government structure? Good, good. What is it? Isabella? Clans. Clans, on your whiteboard, please tell me what is it called when you move by the season? Oh, what is it, Jack? Or what, Aiden? Pastoral. Pastoral. On your whiteboard, please tell me um, what is a unique thing about their nobles? What is a unique thing about their nobles who are put into power? Good, good. Come on, come on, come on. Good, Adrian. They're not hereditary. So if we have a crappy noble, we can kill them and put someone else there, and they're seen as just as powerful. On your whiteboard, please tell me, the Mongols are going to serve as the foundation of what? They are going to be the backbone, the foundation of what major institution? Good. Good. Lauren? Silk Road. On your whiteboard, please tell me, um, who are going to be treated as equal partners and even have small leadership roles and are going to be advisors? Alexandria. Mm -hmm. Women. True or false? Every woman the Mongols come across is treated with respect and seen as equals. True or false? Patel. False. False. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is the main food source of the Mongols. It also serves as their clothing and shelter. Good. What, am, what was I looking for, Vanessa? Animal herding with sheep, goats, and all that stuff. I'll take care of there. All right, here we go. So, the um, biggest thing you need to understand is the Mongolians, uh, the Mongols are military people. They are military power like no one has ever seen. Alexander the Great is going to have a huge empire. The Romans are going to be incredibly successful. But the Romans were liked because of their ability to build, their ability to civilize, their ability to structure a strong government with this idea of democracy. All these things made people like Rome and want to be a part of Rome. No one wanted to be a Mongol because if you're a Mongol, and you are not Mongolian-born, you're seen as inferior and not welcome. So, 
People did not want to be under the control of the Mongols because they weren't going to be in power. The Mongols build their empire off of military pride and military strength. So, militaries are actually called confederations. Confederation is the grouping of large tribes together in order to form a military. Um, when you talk about confederations, they're run by generals, also known as cons. Cons means general, okay? So anytime you see someone's name that ends in a con, that means they're a general of some sort. They are going to use a cavalry. Now, Alexander the Great's the first one to use cavalry to really conquer the empire, and it's going to be uh, very effective, of course. In Alexander the Great's empire, and he's going to use about 30% of his military is going to be cavalry. The Mongolian, the Mongols are going to have 90% cavalry. Is that a big difference? Yes, 30 to 90, absolutely. Now, cavalrys are made up of what? Who can raise my, their hand and tell me what cavalrys are made up of? Micah? Horses, horses. So is it fast or slow moving? Fast moving, absolutely. They're going to be the fastest moving uh, military ever seen um, to that point. Okay? So the Turks are going to be around. They're going to conquer Constantinople. Um, they're going to invade Anatolia and Byzantine, Byzantium is going to fall. And don't worry, they're not going to be around long because the Mongols are going to take over. So, your first big person is Genghis Khan. Now, there's two major spellings, C-H-I-N-G-G-I-S or G-E-N-G-H-I-S. Either or are the same, and you need to know both. And it goes back and forth, okay? Now, his father is poisoned in 1177. He's like eight seven, eight years old at that time, his father is poisoned because he is a noble. So is he poor or is he pretty wealthy? wealthy. He's pretty wealthy. With his father dead, okay, him, his mother, and his brother escape, okay? Because if you learn nothing else, if you're going to commit murder, you've got to kill the kid. Guess what he didn't do? He didn't kill the kid. So at the age of 13, 13, my man, Genghis Khan, is going to revenge, kill, the guy who killed his father. Okay? He's going to cut out his heart and hand it to his mother at age 13. At age 13. What have you done? Nothing. Okay? Nothing. What have you done? Anyway, so his father's going to be poisoned in 1177. As soon as his father's dead, his mother, his brother, and him are going to plummet straight into poverty. Okay, with no father to lead the family, they plot it into, and he just sits there and toils, 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 and he plots revenge. Um, have you ever, do you guys watch Game of Thrones? Yeah. You know that chick who just has a long list of people she's going to kill? Arya. Yeah, whatever her name is. I hate that show, but I know I have to watch it. Anyway, she is based off Genghis Khan. What? He had a list of people he was going to go ahead and kill, and that's exactly what he's going to do. So he's going to go around. He is going to unify every Mongolian tribe under one federation. Now, the biggest thing you need to know is that he wanted absolute loyalty and merit. Anyone who spoke ill of Genghis Khan was going to be murdered. Now, think about it. If you have your own Mongolian tribe, okay, do you want a guy from the outside coming in and taking over control? Yes or no? No. So do you think there's going to be a lot of people who oppose Genghis Khan when he's rising into power? So guess what he does? He kills them all. They estimate that he kills about uh, 50,000 Mongolians before he even really gets going. That's insane. He kills them. He rises into power by the time he's 18. They estimate by the time he was 18 that by himself has killed about 20,000 people. This is insane. It's insane. It is so cool. Anyway, so he tries to bring in all the Mongolians into one federation, one confederation. Okay. Once he does, in 1206, he's going to be named the universal ruler, and that's when he officially gains the title of Genghis Khan. Khan means, Khan means general, he's a universal ruler, okay? So, 
the biggest thing that he has to do is he has to break up this whole tribal thing. Remember, the tribal thing has been around for about 600 years at this point. So breaking up those ties is not something to be ignored at. Okay? Now, what he has to do is he takes something that is incredibly decentralizes it and centralizes it under his control. That is a huge accomplishment. And how he does it is by forming military units, and he also makes everything based on loyalty and merit. You only improve your position if you're good at your job. If you waver in your loyalty to Genghis Khan, he will literally cut your throat in front of everyone to see, and everyone will watch you bleed out in front of him. He's killed um, of his generals. If you lost a battle, uh, he would kill you. That's how effective he was. Now keep in mind, if you know that your general is going to support you and celebrate you when you achieve and do well, and he's going to kill you if you don't, what are you going to be more likely to do? Succeed, absolutely. <coughs> he is going to, if you do well for him, he will protect you, provide for you, and provide for your entire family. Is that enticing if you're a poor kid? Absolutely. He will have complete uh, power and loyalty of his soldiers. Something to a level we've never seen since. His soldiers would literally run into cities um, with millions of people against them and come out victorious. That is how dedicated they were to Genghis Khan. That's why he himself had the largest single man empire in the history of the world. Alexander was second. Uh, Genghis Khan was first, and he almost quadrupled the size of Alexander the Great's empire. That's how effective he is. When we talk about the greatest military minds ever, Genghis Khan is number one, sometimes number two. People say Napoleon is the greatest. He's going to evolve modern warfare. Genghis Khan is going to create what we call medieval warfare. <coughs> So, when we talk about it, uh, Genghis Khan, you need to understand that he wants loyalty over everything, okay? And that's the biggest thing. Now, of course, Aiden, you're not looking at your vocab while you're taking a quiz, right? So, I better put that board away right now. I don't want to see it again. Okay, so I just saw that, so um, I'm pretty pissed. So, biggest thing you need to know is that the Mongolian arms, the best thing the Mongols ever did was invent a short bow, Okay? So, the Mongolians are known for their cavalry. Now, stop for two seconds and look over here. Okay? In Europe, they're going to favor the long bow. The long bow is a little bit longer than this. When you do a long bow, have you ever seen, of course, you've seen the Hunger Games. You see my girl Katniss. Okay? When you do a long bow, you have to pull it all the way back. You use your cheek as a marker. It takes great strength to do a bow and arrow. It's not easy, which is why people today use a compound bow, because you don't like, need any strength. Okay, so you pull it all the way back, and it has to have full extension, then you let go, and then it fires one arrow. So you have to go all the way back, hold it, it's very hard to hold, and you have to shoot. Okay, when you use a long arrow, or a long bow, it's distance. Okay, it's distance. When you use a short bow, what the Mongols are going to invent, it's going to be about that long. Okay, when you pull back, it's like the size of a harp. You can easily hold it, okay? And you just pull back to here. Is that a big difference? Also, it doesn't take that much strength to do a short bow, okay? Now, the short bow is only going to go about 30 feet. But the important thing to know is that these Mongolians, these Mongols, are sitting on horses, shooting a short bow, going, uh, you know, as fast as the horses can go at top speed. So the, do you really need to shoot far away if you're chasing them down? No. Apparently, and this is something that no one's been able to recreate, is that during a Mongol invasion, a normal Mongolian soldier could hold six arrows in his hand and shoot off six arrows while the horse is traveling at full speed. That's insane. They would just go, shh. We don't see how fast um, the Mongols could shoot and fire until we get into mechanized warfare later on. The Europeans, no one else is going to be able to compete with the Mongols in their speed because of how fast they are. It's insane. 
The Mongols are going to be 90% based on cavalry, which means they are going incredibly fast. They're firing at an incredibly fast rate, which means they are the most dominant military the world has ever seen up until we get into World War II. Isn't that insane? It's so cool. <sighs> Fine. All right, so because the Mongols had such an effective cavalry because of the short bow, they are going to take a population of 1 million and conquer China that has a population of 12 million. Because the military is so successful, a military of about 125,000 people can defeat a military of half a million people because of the speed and the merit-based promotions as well as, of course, the short bow. And that's exactly what makes it incredibly effective. Okay? So, <clears throat> Mongols are going to conquer China by 1220. Now, the conquering of China is a very, very, very big deal for the main fact that it is the largest, most powerful, most economically dominant, has the most technology, is the most modern of all the cities and all the countries at the time. And it gets knocked out by a bunch of nomads on horses with this weird thing called a short bow. It's like, it's like if the United States falls tomorrow. Everyone looks to China as the leader of economics, as the leader of government structure and all that stuff, and it just gets knocked out by this weird, it's like if the United States gets knocked out tomorrow by Yes, like Ethiopia, just out of nowhere, like where the hell did they come from? That's how the fall of China looks like to the rest of the world. Everyone's just horrified. But once they take over China, they then invade Russia, and they take the Middle East. And that's why they're as powerful as they are. All right, to your boards. Where are you? Stop when you get to conquer by China by 1220. Stop here. If you're here, put your pen down. If you're here, put your pen down by 1220, China. Uh, short bows, faster shooting on horse, rewarded enemies that surrender, and cool to those who fight. Which we'll talk about in a second. On your whiteboard, please tell me. 90% um, of the Mongolian Empire, uh, army is made out of what? 90% of the Mongolian military is made up of what, Micah? Calvary. Calvary, on your whiteboard, what do we call the Mongolian army? What do we call Mongolian army? Good. What do we got, Dean? Confederation. Confederation. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is the man with the largest single man army ever? Good. Good. Emily? Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is um, the two ways you can be promoted in the Mongolian military. What did you have to be in order to be promoted in the Mongolian military? Two things, that's one thing. Good. What do we got? Vanessa. Merit and loyalty on your whiteboard. Please tell me, cavalries are the foundation of the Mongolian Empire, and they are made out of what? Cavalry is based on what? Good. Patel. Horses. Horses. On your whiteboard, please tell me. Uh, Khan means what? Good. Khan means what, Maya? General. General. Genghis Khan means what? No. Means what? Genghis Khan means what, Jack? Universal leader. Universal leader. On your whiteboard, please tell me what gets conquered in 1220. Good. Isabella. China. What year does Genghis Khan earn the title of Genghis Khan? Good. What is it, Jessica? 1206. 1206. All right. One of the biggest things that you do need to understand about the Mongols is that they are going to use fear as a major tool, and they're the first ones to do it. Don't worry. It'll be recreated by many. However, it is going to be incredibly popular. Now, one of the most effective things that they do is that they are incredibly harsh in their retribution. Okay, imagine you are trying to hold your city, okay, and the Mongols are coming. 
you know for a fact that the Mongols um, just defeated the city over, and they fought the Mongols. The Mongol Mongols got into the city. They literally skinned all the men carrying arms and hung their skin jackets over the walls. Okay, <coughs> they take the heads off of every single man, woman, and child and put them on the top of the walls of the city. They have raped, mutilated, and beaten every single woman to death. Okay? So you're standing there, and the Mongols are coming, and you know for a fact the town on the other side of you surrendered, and they were treated okay. What are you going to do? Are you going to surrender, or are you going to fight? You're going to surrender, and that's highly effective. Their reputation is going to precede them. So much so that women who were non-Mongolian based, that we tried to we, I made very clear earlier, they would literally jump off of the city walls in order to kill themselves before the Mongols showed up. Because the Mongols would literally rape and beat them to death. Women would also kill their children with them. They would jump off the walls together because women, girls, and young boys would also be mutilated and killed and destroyed, all that stuff. They would enjoy that. They felt that if you raised arms against the Mongols and you lost, it was their opportunity to do whatever they wanted. So much so that they became notorious for it, which makes them have a larger reputation of fear, and this reputation is obviously going to precede them, so people are going to surrender, which makes it easier for them to conquer as many territory as they do. Fear is a huge thing. Now, Kubla Khan, um, one of the biggest things that you do need to know is that Afghanistan and Persia is going to try to revolt. Okay? Their revolt is going to be pretty successful. It's going to happen in 12 cities. Now, Genghis Khan, do you think he's going to let that sit? No. What he does, <coughs> he goes to those cities, those 12. He's in China. He personally goes to Afghanistan and Persia goes there, gets everyone out of the city, forces everyone out with his military, does not kill them there, burns the city down, forces them all into one large group, and encircles them with his men. By this time, they all know that their cities have been burned. What they do is that their men go one by one, cutting the throats of 200,000 people. It takes a full confederation, eight hours to kill that many people by the throat. They are killing children, they're killing babies, men, women. They are just literally going and just cutting the throats. They said that the land that this murder was committed on could not be farmed for 80 years because it was so blood soaked. How do you not love the Mongols? They literally just pull back heads like, oh. They literally had to stop and sharpen their blades. They weren't even going <coughs> through bone. They were going through so much flesh, they had to sharpen their knives. Could you imagine those screams? Think about it. <laughs> Could you imagine? And that's the thing. These people were literally encircled, and the army would just go, oh, another throat to kill. And they would just step in and step over the bodies until they got to the very last ones in the center. That is a message. What is the message that Genghis Khan wanted to send? Hold on. What is the message he wanted to show? Don't mess with me. I will literally cut your throats off one by one in the most gruesome act in order to send this message. Guess what no one else is really going to do? No one else is going to rebel. Is that an effective message? You don't get effective unless you're going to put in the dirty work. And literally cutting the throats and blood soaking acres of land. I kind of want the Mongols, man. Eh? Vanessa, what do you mean? Uh, revolt, Genghis Khan responds by bringing, by burning all cities, 12 to the ground, kill all leaders and their families, 200,000 are going to have their throats slit by the army just encircling. I just imagine it like one of the last episodes of the last season of Game of Thrones, you know how they had the massive walls of people? 
you know, the last episode, like, second to last? Yeah. Where they just have the bodies on bodies on bodies oh, on bodies, yeah. and Jon Snow almost gets, like, I, that's what I think it's gotta be. Like, it has to look like that. Like, how else would it look? Yes. Do you think someone... Yeah. What, Dave? Do you think someone, like, played dead? Uh, got me. No, I think they really went through and just well, like. I mean, like if I like it was in the middle, I just like collapse. Is that the? Get somebody else's blood. Yeah, but you're gonna be you. like trampled, because people are gonna be trying to shift and. Oh, well, that's okay. I mean, if I'm gonna be trampled, then I might. I don't know. Trampling means like. But isn't it like your? That's more how your throat's Like it's less painful to just bleed out because you die. Disease is that gonna spread? Of, uh, I mean, you're you're, you're going to disease to dead people. That's the real crime right there. <laughs> Poor hygiene. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's the real crime, Jesus. Yes, Lauren. Okay, so was the Mongolian army bigger? Like, was it like bigger than the amount of people that they had, or were they just way scared bigger? Of them? They were scared of them. They were very effective. They wrangled all. I mean, you have to keep in mind a lot of these are women and children too that they're killing in the twenty thousand. It's they they do it to send a signal saying, "Don't mess with us." Don't fight us. Do what we tell you to do, and we won't kill you. And that's how effective the Mongols are. It's literally fear. When we think of Nazis, like we think, oh my God, how scary are the Nazis? You know, they were so terrible, and they had the Gestapo. All of that's done at night, and it's all done behind the scenes. The Mongols are like, there is no like lie here. We're terrible people, and we're just gonna kill you. So just do what we want, and you won't die a super painful death. Maybe just a quick death. And that's exactly what it's gonna be based on. Now, just following up that story of the 200,000, they said that the crows were so big, they couldn't fly anymore. And they were too big for two generations. That's because what are they doing, Dean? They eat all the bodies. They like had a scratch, like get an itch, okay? And they're like, oh, now I got blood on my face, you know. <laughs> they're not going to live long anyway, Dean. No, but I mean, like, the Mongols are like after the film, like, oh, dang it. Well, STDs. So there's only a couple of STDs well, that are at mean, historical. Like, you know, like, like, oh, oh, man. You know? Yeah, did, that's a, that's a, a good less. question, though. Did, they, did like, a lot of them die from disease? A lot of them are going to die from diseases, but they're not going to die from, like, blood. Like, when you think of AIDS and stuff, which is, like, mostly spread by, like, blood and blood contact, that's not in... Uh, infections, of course. If you get, like, hit by an arrow, you're probably going to die. Just like in the Civil War. If you got shot in the Civil War, you're definitely dying. Unless they could chop off your entire leg, and then you're probably going to die on the table. The idea of getting shot or injured and living is a modern idea. The idea of falling out of a tree and breaking your leg and not dying of septus is a modern idea. Where they can put, pop it back in and do all those types of things. Alright, so the Mongols. <sighs> Aren't they great? Yes, I aspire to be like them. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Oh, gosh. Oh, All right, you're gosh. being recorded, so when you start doing terrible things, Max, you have to react. Come on. Oh, God. All right, here oh, it goes. So Kublai Khan. Kublai Khan is going to be the grandson of Genghis Khan. Kublai Khan is going to rule China. You need to know the three major regions of the Mongolian Empire. Okay? So Genghis Khan is going to conquer all these territories. Once we have the regional cons in place, then they're going to conquer a little bit more. You need to know the uniqueness of each of these areas, which we're going to come back to, of course, in four. So, he is going to rule China. He's incredibly ruthless. No surprise there. He's a Mongolian warlord. Can we agree? Okay. He's also going to be religiously tolerant. Did you know those two went hand in hand? Who knew? Kublai Khan is that guy. He does not care what religion you believe in, as long as you do as he says. I kind of appreciate that. As long as you do what he says, he's going to let you pray to whatever God you want. Now, when you have heard of Marco Polo, okay, imagine that he's hanging out with the Mongols. So he was Huh? Kublai Khan is the guy who's hosting Marco Polo. Now, Marco Polo is famous because Marco Polo writes a book. Marco Polo goes to China, he's an Italian, he goes to China, and Kublai Khan is just like fascinated by this weird guy who shows up from this foreign land far, far away, and he's like, yeah, why don't you come in? And Marco Polo is no idiot. He's like, I'm going to be really nice to this guy. So this guy lets me do whatever I want, and the guy, apparently Marco Polo was like funny, and the ladies liked him, and Kublai Khan liked that. 
So he let him party with him and see how the court lived. And Marco Polo started writing things down and started making comments. Well, Marco Polo is going to get himself in trouble because Marco Polo makes a lot of comments he's not supposed to make. But the thing he does is that he steals Kuba Khan's main, main chick. He gets caught with Kuba Khan's main like, favorite girl of the time because he had like 40 wives. I know. So he, as in Marco Polo, is going to be sent to jail. And as he's sitting in jail, he's like, well, since I'm here, i got plenty of time to keep writing. So he writes his book in jail. Well, the Italian peninsula is like, oh, my God, we want our men back. And they eventually break him out of jail. And he scurries all the way off back to Italy and then publishes his book. And then here we are playing Marco Polo in the pool. Hey, yeah. Uh, yeah, how did you come up with that? Did you just like, he disappears so Marco. There you go. <laughs> so, Marco Polo is going to be Kublai Khan, and we're going to come back to that. Um, the other big thing, he establishes the Wan Dynasty. The Wan Dynasty is one of three foreign ruled dynasties that we'll come across in China, and happens to be the first. Okay? He is going to, now, Kublai Khan is going to try to conquer. Uh, Japan is the biggest one. He's going to fail twice. A typhoon is um, a hurricane in the Pacific, essentially. It rotates a different way, but that's fine. It's pretty much a hurricane in the Pacific. He's going to try to take Japan twice. Now, remember, when we talk about Japan, they've only had two empires, the Cilia and the Heian. Um, the Heian, sorry, not Heian. The Heian is going to be the one that's going to be fighting the Mongols. Now, do you think the Heian, which is a very small empire that's now decentralized, do you think they're really going to be able to defeat the largest, most powerful empire the world's ever seen? No, they can't defeat them. So they see it as a divine act of God that during the two invasions, a typhoon shows up. This is really important. After the Mongols try invading, they close their borders, and they won't open them until the end of the fourth. Okay? Once they have this whole idea of divine winds, which is what they believe the gods are protecting China, Japan, these divine winds are going to be the justification for the industrialization and the corruption of China and Korea, which they're going to do during period uh, six. And it's also going to be the reason why they feel they have the right to bomb the United States at Pearl Harbor, these divine winds. So this lore of the divine winds is going to follow Japan all the way through their history and is going to justify their uh, industrialization. It's going, to, uh, it's going to justify their imperialization and it's going, to uh, it's going to justify their war. And so it's a huge deal. They believe they've been chosen by the gods in order to prevail. So divine winds is not something that just happens once. Kamikaze, yes, means divine winds. That they believe that their kamikaze pilots were being supported by God. That's why they use them to crash into our ships and as a last ditch effort. This is part of the reason why during World War II the Japanese refused to quit, which is why we had to drop two atomic bombs. It's a huge deal. It's only going to become more important as time goes by. This is the foundation of the lore of Japan. Okay? Now the Golden Horde is Russia. Now the uh, Mongols are going to take it in the early 1200s. They are going to then take Crimea. They're also going to attack Germany, the Poland, and Hungary. And this is going to be as far west as they get. This is really important. Have you ever wondered why Russia is a little odd? Okay. And I mean this with the kindness. There's no other European country that's like Russia. Can we agree? Their cultures, their traditions, it's very different. There is no country in Asia that is like Russia. The reason why Russia is as quirky and as unique and has no other really similar culture around it is because the Mongols are going to hold on to it the longest. The Mongols are going to be kicked out of Middle East first, then they're going to be kicked out of China, and about 200 years after they're kicked out of China, they're going to be kicked out of um, Russia, and this isn't going to happen until about the 1500s. Okay, and they've been there for about 400, about 1600s. And so that's a really long time. Now, the Golden Horde is a big deal because it's going to be the foundation of the new system. Now, Crimea is a big deal. Okay, They're going to conquer Crimea in the late uh, 18th to so the early 1700s. They're going to take it. 
Now, this is important in modern times because Putin just took it back four years ago. Actually, two years ago. Okay? He just invaded it. Do we remember this? Almost caused World War III. Kind of a big deal. Yeah? He used the justification of the Golden Horde, conquered it during Mongolian times. He said it's been ours since the 1200s. You don't even care. You don't even care. He literally said it's been ours since the Golden Nobody writes Australia's Mongols. Yes. Mongols. Okay. So your next one is the Iconate of Persia. These are your um, Middle Eastern uh, Mongols. You need to know Golden Horde is Russia. You need to know the Iconate of Persia. Makes pretty simple. You know it's the Middle East. Um, big thing is Baghdad sacked 200,000 and massacred there. How exciting. They're really good at killing. How they did that with them? They actually made like a big fence. They pushed everyone into one area and then just burned them. That's boring. I know, I know. Can you imagine the screams? The screams would be really hot. The smell would last longer. Do you think any of the Mongolian warriors got PTSD? I don't know. They were pretty victorious. But like they saw so much death. Yeah, they were really victorious. And they got well paid. They'd probably be killed. Probably. Probably. I mean, I would assume they would, of course, because they are human beings, and the idea of killing another human being is pretty horrific. But a lot of the time, they're going at such a fast speed, they're, like, just shooting the little arrows super fast, so they're kind of just running over them. Well, like, when they did the whole, you know, could you throw them? Yeah, I would think there would be some significant, like, backlash. I don't know how you'd sleep well at night, which is probably why they, they drank them. and raped so many women, just to kind of take their mind off of it. Maybe it's because they saw and they drank <laughs> and raped women. There was a and in there. But isn't that like isn't that another traumatic thing? Like you're raping women, getting drunk all the time, and just killing people. Like, what, what kind of lifestyle are you living? Mongols. <laughs> Guys, when I say that the Mongols are raping women, I am not like this. Is not in jest. It's not like a comic relief because I don't find rape to be funny. They are literally just raping the major populations of Mongols of the Asian population. They're just raping them. Which is why pretty much every single person from Asia has Mongolian blood in them. And about 30% of all Asians can tie themselves directly to Genghis Khan. Because he raped and forced women to carry his children to term. And then would kill the mother and raise the child himself. Maybe the Mongols didn't get PTSD because they were like, that isn't everybody else. That's or maybe themselves. they didn't live long lives. I would say that would be it. Okay? See ya! Enjoy the Mongols! Is it a little too early to be killing this many people? It's only too early. Alright, have a good time. <laughs> My girl.